gone through that last furnace in our lives. We are grateful that you have called us to follow you. Help us to build upon a firm foundation so that we may serve you faithfully and effectively. We pray in Jesus' name.
this time of year, as the snow begins to melt, I start thinking about gardens and getting the garden going and planting a garden. But sometimes it's hard to tell what the plants are. So I was going to try to guess what these plants are. Jesus says, how do you tell what kind of fruit tree you've got? So we're going to guess. Guess what kind of plant? Can you tell what kind of tree that is? Very hard to tell, right? Which is easier to tell what kind of tree it is from the leaves or from the fruit? The fruit. Da fruit. Da. Jesus says you will know what kind of tree it is by what kind of fruit it has. And he wants by that it means he wants all of us to bear good fruit in our lives. Now we don't no, no apples or oranges grow off our hands, right? What that means is the things we do should be good things that people should immediately be able to tell that we are followers of Jesus by what we do, and how we say, how we talk, and how we behave toward people, and how much we love people. So let's pray. God, we pray that you will make us fruitful by making us loving and kind and caring for other people, so that whenever people see us and see what we do, they will know that we are your followers. Amen. Okay. Now, can you put the... Put the uh, the bowl on the table. Is it too heavy? All right. Okay. Put it right in the middle of the table. And everybody, yes. It's Andrew's birthday today. Oh. We should say happy birthday. Is that okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Happy birthday to you. Yay. Okay, you can head downstairs or you can go back to your family, whichever you prefer. have been talking about what we were looking for from Jesus, just like the disciples who first met Jesus along the way as he was passing by the River Jordan. That John the Baptist said, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and 
several of the disciples of John started following him, and Jesus turned around and said, what are you looking for? And so we began to examine what we were looking for in a Lamb of God. What are we looking for in the church? You remember we talked about how the first thing we always hope for is welcome. We hope for welcome. And we say, is this seat taken? And hope somebody will say, oh, please, sit with us. Join us here. Sit here. When you come into a church, you hope people will say, yeah, we're glad to have you here. Come and sit with us. Come and be here. Be part of us. We talked about Jesus meeting the woman at the well and how she wanted respect for her ideas and her thoughts and who she was. And she wanted to be appreciated and loved, just as we all do. We want respect and we hope for love. We talked about wanting to commit ourselves to something bigger than ourselves. Not just making more money, being more comfortable, having a pleasant life with friends who are willing to say hello to us. We want something bigger and more important in our lives. We talk about something that is lasting in value to our lives. Not, not something that's just going to wither away. Like a nicely kept yard withers away in a drought. We want something that will last. We committed ourselves to Jesus. We wanted to be followers of Jesus. We said, yes, this is the time. Let's be followers of Jesus. What does that look like? If Jesus says, follow me, what's he got in mind? How do we do it? I want to spend some time talking about that. The first thing it takes to be a follower of Jesus is a commitment to be a follower of Jesus. It sounds obvious. Some people have learned it in a, in a ritualized form, in a form of like a prayer. A lot of churches call it the sinner's prayer. And there's various forms of this. We made mistakes. We want to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Various phrases like that. But it's not. A lot of people get confused on this. I think that they think saying the words is what gives them a new life. It's not the words that are the key thing, but the idea that in making this kind of commitment, you're committing yourself to a new way of life. You're giving yourself to Jesus, putting Jesus in charge. Just like the early Revolutionary War soldiers in America elected their officers, put them in charge, and said, we're going to follow your orders and do what you say. We put Jesus in charge of our lives and say, Jesus, you will be the one to direct what we do. It needs a real commitment. That means something that's very uncomfortable to most of us. At least most of us that I've known in American society, but certainly me, because we want to stay in control. We want to decide how much time we put into volunteer work. We want to decide how much of our resources we pour into any given activity of people wanting stuff from us. We want to decide whether to answer that pesky phone call from somebody who's soliciting money from us. And if we pick it up and get that call, we want to decide whether we play along or not. When Jesus comes knocking on our door and says, follow me, we want to decide, well, I have time for you on Tuesday, Lord. I have time for you maybe on the weekend if I don't have anything else coming up. Jesus says, follow me, and calls for a full commitment. How do we get ourselves in a mindset that allows us to commit ourselves fully to Jesus? First of all is the decision to try. The decision to try. And that doesn't come easily for some people. It doesn't come immediately for some people. But it takes an effort to try. Just as our toddlers have to learn to try to learn to walk, have to try to learn to eat with a spoon, have to try to learn to sit still during a boring sermon. It takes effort. It takes practice. But you don't do any of that without deciding you're going to try. Then Jesus says, those who hear my words and do them will be like the one who built a 
house on a solid foundation. A solid foundation like a rock. Anybody who's ever built anything, even a playhouse or a storage shed or a garden box, knows that if you don't have it on something solid, it's not going to last. In a house especially, if it doesn't have a decent foundation, you're going to spend every evening looking at the cracks in the wall, wondering how it's going to do. A lot of older houses around here have really shallow foundations, and you can tell. You walk in and you see cracks everywhere. And you think, well, I don't want to stay here too long. <laughs> how do we build that solid foundation of doing what Jesus says? Well, the first thing, we got to know what Jesus says. We have to know what Jesus teaches. That sounds obvious too, but how many people never really try to learn? Some people spend a lot of time memorizing Bible verses. I don't know if you grew up in a tradition like that where you memorized verses and their citations. Who knows? John 3.16. You know that one? Yeah. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever should believe. You can say it really fast. And you know the citation? A lot of people memorize a bunch of citations and a bunch of verses. It takes a lot of energy to do that, and that's all well and good. But that's not the only way you tell what Jesus' teachings are. Because Jesus did not teach only in little epigrams. In fact, not even primarily in little epigrams, like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mostly, Jesus taught in stories and by example. He would say something and then work it out, live it out, and do it. He would tell a story about people in their lives going through struggles of one sort or another. You know a lot of these stories. The story of the Good Samaritan. The story of the prodigal son. Right? The story of the woman who lost a coin. There's all kinds of stories that Jesus told. And if you don't know the stories, you don't know all there is to know about Jesus. You need to know a lot about Jesus, but what if you don't like to read? I know a lot of people say, Pastor, I'd love to read the Bible, but I just hate to read. And I just don't know all those big old words. And I get intimidated. And I look at the book, and it looks too darn long. I'd like it to be condensed into like a comic book. Then I would know. It's hard, maybe, at times. So what do you do if you don't especially like to read? What are some strategies? What do you think? Come to Bible study and talk about things. That's a good way of picking stuff up. Some people start by reading The Upper Room or some other devotional book and learning about things that way. You can read in small snippets. That reminds you that you don't have to read the whole Bible in one sitting. In fact, I don't know anybody who could. You read a little bit at a time. Here's my hint. Pick place that's a story. Pick part of it that's a story rather than a, a list of rules. It's much more interesting. If you ever sat down and tried to read the Internal Revenue Code, which I had to in law school, it will put you to sleep faster than anything else. And that's true of any list of rules, I guarantee you. Stories are better. What if you just aren't comfortable reading at all? What do you do? Thank goodness we live in a time where you don't have to. Things are available online, audio books. You can get it on CD. You can listen to it. You can get movies about it. You can find all kinds of things to learn in various ways. What's another good way to learn about Jesus and what Jesus taught? A little commercial? Thank you. Can I have an amen? amen. <laughs> Come to church. If you don't like church, you're going to find some other church. Find a church. Be in church with other people because we teach each other. Not only in what we say and in what we say in worship and what we hear in sermon, but how we act toward each other and how we act in life. Be part of a church family and we can learn about the teachings of Jesus. Jesus says then you have to put it into effect. You can't just hear the words. You have to do them. So how do you do the teachings of Jesus when it isn't all about lists of rules to follow? You want to act like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. 
lot of people used to wear bracelets and said, what would Jesus do, right? It sounds cute, but it's also good advice. If we try to approach life in the same way Jesus did, we have a very good example. That's how we learn most of the things in life, is following good examples. We follow the example of our parents. We follow the example of people we admire at school. We follow the example of people we admire at work. We follow the example of Jesus in the way he reacted towards people who were unkind to him. In the way he reacted to people who were in need. In the way he reacted to people who had less, either less money or less social status or less power. That is the way of learning how to put Jesus' words and thoughts into action, is act like Jesus. If we're going to do that, and we follow through, if we really commit, if we really try to learn, and if we really try to do, we will start bearing fruit. Now, here comes the rub. Jesus said, you'll know them by the fruit. Know them by the fruit means you know what people really care about by what they produce in their lives. It's like reputation. It's what do people really do and really accomplish. And the only way to know what we're doing is to pay attention. Here's where the analogy of the tree starts to fall apart, but in a way that's a good way. A tree, Jesus says, you can't get fruit from a thistle. Right? A tree can only produce the kind of fruit it produces. It's genetically dictated. And it can't do anything other than its nature. But then he starts talking about hearing his words and doing them. And what does that suggest? It suggests we're not stuck. We can change what we are producing. We can change what we do. We can change what we think and how we act. We have the freedom to produce good fruit even if we have not produced good fruit before. We have the freedom to become a follower of Jesus and produce the kind of kingdom that he is talking about in our lives. We have the ability to do that, not because we're so special, but because of God's grace. It is a gift from God that we are able to change, that we're able to start over and we're able to start doing things differently and better than we've done them before. We won't even know if we're doing it, though, unless we pay attention. We have to look honestly at the fruit we're producing. Are we making any difference? And if we are making a difference, what kind of difference are we making? That's not only important for people individually, it's important for churches. What kind of fruit are we producing? Or are we just doing the same stuff over and over again? Activity is not the same thing as productivity. We need to tell whether we are accomplishing our mission of bringing people to Christ, helping disciples grow, and sharing Christ's love. One of the ways you can tell is on the front cover of your bulletin. There's a picture of all that soup we collected for people who need food. That's something that we created, that we did together. What else have we done? We have to think about it and honestly decide, is what we're doing making sense? Is it productive or not? We have to watch, just like you're pruning a tree. Get rid of things that aren't working and try new things that will. We need to do that in our lives as many ways as we can. Because in that way, we will be giving ourselves to Christ. Giving ourselves to Christ and producing good fruit. So, what is step one? I talk about this all the time. What is step one? Make a real commitment. Decide to do that. You can do that right now in your hearts. You can do it right now if you've never done it before. Lord Jesus, by which mean I mean boss, I give myself to your control. If you've done it a hundred times, it doesn't matter. Do it again. Think about that this week. I want to give myself to Christ's leadership. What will that involve? What will it be? Will it be scary or will it be fun? If we do it right, it will probably be both. 
That's number one. Let's decide to try. And then we'll take it from there. Fruit and produce. Another good way to practice our commitment of ourselves to Christ. We lift up our joys and our concerns together and we share them with each other as a way of sharing our love. We're celebrating this week. We have a new birth. Odin Michael Gallagher is born to Mary Catherine and Patrick, and the grandparents are with Mary Ann and Steve Mitchell. So, Congratulations to their, their family, and we're excited about that. If you haven't seen the baby pictures, you've got to ask. She's got them on the phone, so that's a joy to celebrate. We have prayers of concern for Dan Sikora, who had a recent appendectomy, the son of Ray Sikora. We have a prayer of concern for Jim Drew, who uh, is having a heart procedure on Thursday. And for Debbie Crom, who is uh, going for a I think it's meniscus surgery, right? On March 4th, is that, is that right? And then we're going to continue our prayers for Frank Hefner, Marie Pounder, Barbara Tracy. Lord, we pray also for all those who are sick, all those who are struggling. We lift up all these joys and concerns in our hearts, knowing that you hear us and care about us. And so we gain confidence and we lift up these other prayers that are on our hearts, whether we say them out loud or silently at this time. Our Sherry and uh, Lori. Charlotte Colbert and I see you and her sons who have made decisions to stop us. Lord, we give you thanks that you hear us, that you care about us, and that you hear us whether we have spoken our prayers aloud or spoken them in our hearts. And come before you with confidence, the confidence that little children have when they are at home, surrounded by those who love them. As we pray the words you taught us to say in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Each week we share our community crosses with someone for time to remind them that we're praying for them, and that God is with them in all things. We had a prayer for Chuck when he was in the hospital, but he was in isolation. He couldn't have it there, so we can take it with you now if you want. Where shall we send it? Where? I'm glad to see you back, by the way. It's an answer to prayer. Where shall we send the other community cross this week? Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are always with us in good times and bad. We pray that this cross will be a sign of your presence and love. We also pray that it will be a sign of our prayers, which we send forth with it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bring now our gifts and our offerings. And we are grateful.
sent, O Lord, for the work of the building of your kingdom. Take our lives and make them entirely yours. Amen. Let's join in singing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Number 368. Number 368. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. 